Welcome to the Explosive Street Podcast with Jay Bidney. In this episode, we're going to go over training programs and try to discuss how come people are not getting results and what I'm seeing from the programs that the people have given me through the past and kind of, it's just been really griping me because some of these people have paid a lot of money for these programs, but the, re the programs are kind of letting these people choose their own weights and choose their what their rate of exertion is, their RPEs and stuff, rate of procedure exertion, I hate that thing. When I write stuff for my people at the gym, I don't give a shit how they feel, I care that they get it done. Your feelings do not matter. Um, I had some kids the other day said, Jared, I feel bad, I don't think, it... and then when they were squatting, they were beating their squat numbers all the time, and so they did, Jared, I don't feel good, but then this killed their bench. So, like, if you go in and you feel, oh, this is heavy or whatnot, I don't care if it feels heavy or not or whatever your rate of perceived, how you perceive something is, because it may be hard, but if you're still able to do it, who gives a shit if it's an RP of nine or whatever these people are going off of? The RPE scale should be thrown out the stupid window. I hate the RPE scale, but I also hate these people getting scammed on programs where the programs, are, they're not giving them the workload consistent enough for them to get the results. And so it's just frustrating. I've gotten hammered. People have been for years wanting me to do online programming, online programming. It's a lot of work on my part. And after seeing how some of these people are getting scammed and, and things like that, I will probably open up the online program stuff for a few people. I don't, I don't want to take my entire day away because I still have to run the gym in the afternoon. You know that my primary focus is my athletes at the gym. But if I do the online training program, I'm going to do video. I want you to respond back to me like I have the athletes to the gym so that when I'm training you or whatever, you are getting what you're paying for. You're getting a desired result. And so when I say a lot of these programs, they're not consistent with the exercises. They may be doing movement patterns, and I, and I don't know. That may be fine if you're already at the elite level to where you don't have to have a load to take you from throwing 93 miles an hour to throwing 95 miles an hour. But if you're throwing 89, you better do something to increase your strength to where you're throwing 95. Then you could do this randomized stuff to where it does not matter what you do as long as you don't regress. And so I even had a kid, he throws for um, a university. He quit benching. The university did not want him to bench. And I'm not saying bench is the all, end all be all, but he noticed when he quit benching, he went from throwing 95 miles an hour to throwing 92. So then he came home and we talked about it over summer. We got his bench back up and he went back and he's back to throwing 95. But I don't understand why the university, you know, a lot of these people are scared to let their athletes, hey, don't bench too much. Don't do this. Don't do that. Well, shit, if you would teach them how to bench, you wouldn't have to worry about him and her. But the, most people don't even know how to bench. Most people cannot improve the bench press at the rate I can improve their bench press. And I've even had, the thing about the bench is correlated with swing speed, whether it be baseball, softball, golf, lacrosse, um, or even throwing. Um, I've had a lot of people, I, when I train my softball girls, they'll come in, I'll test their throwing speed, and I'll see what their starting point is, and at the end of each month, I'll test their 40, I'll test their vertical, and I'll test their throwing speed, and I'll see how much their bench press and their squat and their jumps have gone up as well. But I had this one girl, she came in, she threw, started off at 54, she threw 54, next month 55, 56, 58, uh, then 60. So 54, after four or five months or whatever that was, she continued to improve on a per month continuum. And so as she was there, she got better and better. Had another girl go from throwing 54 to 66 miles an hour. Um, a year and a half ago, I had a lot of baseball players come in. And in one semester, the the average of the baseball player I had was eight miles per hour in that semester improve um, and all I did was just make them stronger and so I even had a lacrosse team I took this lacrosse team and we're still talking about bench press here and why it's so important to drive that up and not switch what you do all the time I had a lacrosse team came in and I measured the throwing speed well I measured their bench to see who could bench the most and I measured the throwing speed the 40 and whatnot like I do everything else the lacrosse girls whoever had the highest bench press on the team also threw the ball the fastest 
And so as I was trying to make, the, they were going about one mile, sometimes two miles an hour per month, almost the same thing as the throwing uh, for the softball girls. And the girls who improved the most also had the most miles per hour improvement on their throwing speed for the lacrosse stick. So um, years ago, I'm not, I'm stronger now than I was years ago when I was doing a lot more golf. I got this guy sent me some stuff on golf. Going in and getting my swing speed tested, not being a very consistent player, not playing all the time. The more you play all the time, the higher your swing speeds are. And so just to get fitted for the right shaft, my average swing speed was 124 miles an hour uh, with my driver. And so I think my uh, five iron was 103, 105, somewhere in there. But I love golf and like, my driving, I tee off with a three iron, and the LPGA Tour driving distance is 250 yards. Well, my three iron goes 250 yards, and I'm not a consistent golfer. I have a decent swing, but if I were to play more often, it'd be a lot more fluid. The thing that I lack when I play, I've got a high swing speed. That's because I've got a lot of power. But my smash factor, my consistency of the ball hitting the club face at the right spot all the time is not there. So my, um, so I can be a lot, my three iron, if my smash factor was a little bit higher, my three iron could almost probably go 265 or something around there. Um, but that's the thing that I lack. I still get it out there at 245, 250 yards consistent. That's not bad for a drive because as you get closer to the green, the more precise you have to be. I just gotta get the ball off the tee box into play, not use a driver and end up slicing it in the woods or getting out of bounds or whatnot and cause me strokes. If I want to play, I'm trying to shoot low, uh, low 40s, high 30s. And so that's the thing I'm trying to say. I'm not a consistent golfer, but my three iron is higher than the average LPGA Tour driving distance when they're using a driver. Uh, my swing speed's higher than the average uh, PGA Tour for the males. So, and I'm not a professional golfer. I'm not even a good amateur golfer. I'm just telling you the factors, and you see this stuff on Golf Channel, and, and, and on TV, hey, do this to improve your swing, hey, do this to improve your swing. You just freaking get stronger, your swing speed will improve. You don't have to use gimmick A, B, C, D, E, F, G. You, you know, it's just kind of like these people are, hey, Jared, what do you think about this at the gym? Hey, what do you think about this? If you get stronger, that will fix a lot of your freaking problems. Just like um, it's easier for a 16-year-old boy to shoot a basketball from half court versus a 16 year old female, the male is stronger so the ball is going to travel further. So that should let you know right there that strength is a big factor in a lot of different things. So just trying to get that out. When I program someone's bench, I've seen throwing speed miles per hour, I've seen crawl speed miles per hour pick up. Um, golf kids, I did have some golf kids come in there, but you know, like these freaking golfers are so weenish, they're scared to come in and uh, do anything for weights because that whole golf community for the average person is so like anti-weights and they want to do all the stupid stuff on the golf channel or these rotational stuff. No, they're trying to sell you again. They're trying to do stuff that you think would be right because they're trying to make you believe, hey, if you buy this, this will help that. They don't want to tell you the simple answer to get stronger, but you know what I'm finding out with more and more looking at these programs, most people don't know how to program people to get stronger. That's frustrating, and that's kind of why I'm doing this podcast. Now, if you want to go, being that bench takes care of your swing speed, whether it be lacrosse swing speed for the males or the females, whether it be golf, club head speed, um, baseball throwing miles per hour, softball throwing miles per hour, um, even javelin throwing. Uh, if you watch the biggest javelin throwers out there, they're benching a butt ton of weight out there, and they're track and field, so why do they? Why can they load up the bench, but the baseball players can't load up their bench? You know, bench press is also correlated with swing speed of the baseball bat and softball bat. The girls that I had benched the most were also their leading home run hitters on their high school softball teams. Not one local high school team. I had several girls from Fulton leading home run hitters. Guess what? They go to college, and they're also the leading home run hitters on their softball team in college. I don't know why it's correlated, but a lot of times. If you if you improve this bench, if you if you're a coach out there and you got a softball girl or whatever, if you track her bat speed and you increase her bench, you'll see a direct correlation between increased bench and increased bat speed. Well, I told this little ninth, ninth grader if y'all see my um, 
YouTube or I don't know if I posted it on Instagram or not. I got this ninth grade female to bench 135 when we went from like 105 to 135 in three and a half months or something like that, something pretty quick. And she sent me a text message one night, Jared, I hit my first home run. I said, I told you, if you keep benching, you'll have a lot more power at the bat. And so, but as we get in these programs later on, you'll understand people don't know how to progress people's bench. Therefore, they may not be getting results, so they're gonna try every freaking gimmick out there in the world in order to try to figure out this problem. Well, I can straight up tell you, increase, increase your bench and you'll be all right. Now, squatting, so we got bench. I gotta improve the bench because all those things happen if I improve the bench. Squatting will improve running your 40 yard dash time. It's not gonna improve your 100, well, take that back. It will improve your 100 meter. I had a girl several years ago she came to me running a 5640 in the gym. We got it down to 52. This girl was going into the ninth grade. And by me improving her running speed that much, I told her she's got a shot to break the 100 meter record at her high school as a freshman. So she goes in, she breaks the 100 meter record as a high school freshman, and I never saw her at the gym again. And, and the bad thing about that is, I showed her that she could get faster. I tested her each month. I showed her mother that I tested her each month. I'm trying to prove to you, hey, you're doing this, you're doing that, whatever. And the bad part about that is she never came back. But she also never broke her record ever again. So that record she set as a high school freshman, she never broke it and she ran track all four years of high school. She also played on sports softball. Well, you need the acceleration softball if you want to steal, if you're an outfielder, you need to run and track down a ball or whatnot, you always need running speed. And so I don't understand my freshman, my senior self would never let my freshman self beat me. So as a senior, she let her freshman self beat her. She was very athletic, she was not, she didn't gain a whole lot of weight over the years or anything, she just got more mature. Hey, same thing, I was, I gained probably 50 pounds through my high school career but at the end of my high school career, I was still faster than I was as I was a freshman. Now, how in the hell is this girl slower as a senior than she was a freshman? The answer is she quit training. She thinks by going to track practice and doing her sport, she'll be fine. You know what? That's embarrassing. And so, back to squat, sorry for the rant. Squat will directly improve your running if you're not squatting over five reps. If you're squatting six, eight, 10 plus reps, that has been shown to actually hinder speed performance. And so another thing is we box squat for our sprint speeds because I've had several kids in the gym before, if you watch that how to box squat for sprint speed on the YouTube I did, I gave a demonstration to these two kids. One kid wanted to come to me and just box squat only. And, um, or he didn't give a shit what he did. He wanted, this one kid wanted to regular squat, this other kid wanted to box squat because he needed to get faster because if you're, there's one, both of them played football, one of them played football and one of them played baseball. So the other kid didn't do anything, he just played football only, the other kid played baseball and football. So the kid was primarily trying to go to school for baseball, so he had to get a 60 yard time down. And so if you improve your 40 yard dash, you'll improve your 60 yard time. But the other kid just played football, he didn't care about box one. He did not want to box one, he did not want to even acknowledge or even want to consider box one. And I tried to tell him, I said, I don't give a shit if you squat 600 pounds. If you're slow off the ball, you're not gonna play. I don't care if you squat 800 pounds in the high school weight room. I don't care about impressing the high school weight room coaches at all. All I care about is in, in pre, in pre, uh, impressing your, your sport coaches. And so I don't care what you do in the weight room. You know, you're gonna be that typical, stereotypical kid. You're super strong in the weight room, but you're about as athletic as a flea. Um, a, probably a dead flea, because a flea is going to be more athletic than you are. But anyway, so they were about the same height. Hmm. They both moved 315 at six meters per second. Okay, so same height, same approximate body weight, and moving the same load at the same speed. All right, so the first month, I tested them both at a 5140 yard dash. And another kicker about the story, one of the kids running the 5140 dash went to a speed, came to me when he was younger, Went to a speed and agility place because I don't do stupid speed and agility stuff. Um, because, you know, just like the 
regular swing speed in the golf shit. Just, hey, just pick out this nice fancy device or you just do this little drill right here and it's gonna improve this. Bullshit. So this kid left me, came back a year later, ran a 5-1 again, exact year later, from November to November, ran a freaking 5-1. So I sent his dad uh, a picture of his folder where he ran the same 40 one year later after going somewhere else trying to do speed training. And his dad said, how did I know that was coming? Because I'm no freaking measure shit, so I know what I'm doing. I don't want someone to pay me and not improve. Anyway, so both of them squatted 5-1. At the end of the first month, one of them ran a 5 flat, the other one ran a 5-1. Next month, one of them ran a 5-1 again, and the other ran a 4-9. So if me and my buddy, and my buddy's starting to beat me in the 40-yard dash, I'm going to say, screw this record squat, I want a box squat. Still would not have it. Jared, I want to regular squat, regular squat at school. Oh. I'm going to do another podcast episode on why I hate box squatting because the schools don't do it, so the schools don't know the benefit of it. And that's very frustrating. You know, like, hey, I want to do what I do at school. I don't give a crap what you do at school. If you box squat, it will also improve your regular squat. So who cares? And plus, if you're going to school, high, I got a lot of kids that go to high school weight training. They're regular squatting there. They come to me, box squat. Why not get the hell benefit of both worlds? Except for when you come to me, at least you're getting speed benefit as well. Anyway, did not want it. The next month, the kid came in, he ran a 5-2. So now we went from a 5-1 to 5-2. The other kid ran a 4-8. The next month, the kid ran a 5-2 again, and now his buddy ran a 4-7. That's half a second. So now the kid that ran a 5-2 ended up, I don't know, I never, after they left me for that summer, I never saw that one kid again, but the kid that ran a 4-7, came because now he was going to college to play a sport. So I try to help him. I try to warn him. I try to tell him. I try to give him plenty of examples of other people's gym. And now you'd figure after he got slower or did not get any faster, you would think he would freaking kind of get the hint. And, and get this, here's the kicker. By the end of that semester of training, they were both moving 405 at 0.6 meters per second. So why did the box squat improve that one kid to a four seven and the box and the regular squat did not improve the other kid. Regular squatting is the elasticity. Box squatting breaks up the eccentric concentric chain, causing more neural demand on the nervous system to fire and overcome for inertia. Much more. So you got higher demand on the nervous system with box squatting. You got elasticity training with the regular squat. And I'm going to do um, a podcast later on with this stupid track stuff. I hate freaking track. I've had so many people, if you heard the last episode, they leave me, they go to track, or someone trying to improve. I had a kid who came to me during track season this year, he went from a four, seven to five flat. And and all this stuff, like I had this guy, speed, speed training, speed training, speed training, speed training is freaking eyewash, it means it's trying to make something look good, make you feel good, but you don't get a damn thing for it. So you're going to go do all this work, all this work, and not get paid. Hey, how about you build me a house and I not pay you? Not gonna happen. So um, now we're gonna talk about power versus elasticity training. Track needs more elasticity. And I hate track for sports. Track is for track. Don't try to bring that shit into football, baseball, softball, um, and your short sprint speed things. And I'm getting that next podcast because that's kind of driving me crazy because all these people want to do all these A skips, B skips, and all that stuff and all the elastic work. You don't need elasticity until after 30, 25, 25, maybe even 30 yards at the most. And so the last 10 yards of the race, you need the elastic part. No, your 20 yard dash when you're playing in sports is the most important thing that you could do. I've had people run faster 20s and other, zero to 20 faster than others, but I've also had people run 20 to 40 faster than the other kid, but the other kid had a better 20. Still, I was about the same 40, but if you're playing a sport, you're going to have to have that short distance. If you're in the football field, I'm going to get on that podcast later, so I'm not going to get too far on that. But we're going to talk about elasticity training versus power uh, training. Um, so another thing we do, we do 45 hyper. 45 hyper, if you got a kid that's going to go to um, football camp and stuff where they're starting to test this broad jump stuff more often, 45 hyper will going directly improve broad jump performance. Better than trap bar and better than deadlift. Uh, I had a girl at 150 pounds go from 7'6 to 8'4 when she got to where she was doing 135 pounds on uh, 45 hyper. Uh, I had my softball, if I need to show some improvements, like, hey, what are we training for? 
even if I, and that's the, the girl had a camera bar with um, 45 on each side. The camera bar was actually 55, um, uh, geez, 65 pounds. So it's actually like doing 155 for her. But I'll have some kids maybe put a little bar on the back or whatever when they first start. And when I retest their bras up at the end of each month, most of them on average go up about six inches. But as we start to get stronger and stronger, I start to load that 45 hyper more and more. And so this past week, I got a piece of equipment in that supposed, I'm hoping, without doing any type of elasticity training, if I can improve that 20 to 40 range of some of the people that are struggling at the gym, if I can improve the strength from that machine is going to help me do, I'll actually have a goal mine because I can improve the 20 yard dash better than most people because I can improve the squats quicker. So hopefully that helps. And you know, dumbbell jumps correlated with sprint speed. So we do dumbbell jumps. We bench, squat, work our lower back, and we dumbbell jump. The thing about the jumping and the dumbbells is it will improve your jump height. Now you can improve your squat but if you're not improving your 40 yard dash as your squats improving it's because you're slacking off on your dumbbell jumps and so there's got to be a specific load that you jump with and a certain way that you do it and it will directly improve so fast twitch fibers your explosive fibers you have intermediate fibers and when you're squatting you're actually targeting when you're squatting extremely heavy loads you're actually targeting your faster fibers so you can take those intermediate fibers and have a switch from those intermediate fibers to more fast fibers and so by squatting heavy loads we're, we're shifting those intermediates that don't know whether they want to go to the slow side or whether they want to go to the fast side um, so we're taking those by the way we squat and our box squat causing more neural drive we're getting a shift from those intermediate fibers to the fast fiber side. And we're using our dumbbell jumps to sharpen the rate at which those fibers or newly recruited fibers are learning how to fire. So get that shift. The dumbbell jumps will teach those new fast switch fibers, new fast switch oriented fibers, how to fire quicker. Therefore, when we go to test our run, boom, perfect. So now we've got a box water, which is our strength speed, and our dumbbell jumps, which is our speed strength so we're getting both ends of the strength spectrum in the gym all the time we're not dedicating one day to dumbbell jumps we're not dedicating one day to heavy squats we're going to heavy squat and we're going to freaking jump the same day and we're going to repeat that over and over and over again and what i'm going to get into with these different training programs is i test the 40 yard dash every month most people that listen to my podcast know that i test all the time and so if you got a kid comes the first month he improves the next month he improves again the next month he didn't improve then if you go count how many days he squatted hey you only squatted five times this month I know Jared I know I can't blah 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 I said look if you squat you got to squat minimum eight times per month I said give me at least eight the kid came 10 hmm, got a better improvement in our sprint speed and so this one kid was frustrated, Jared, I'm not improving my squat. Why, why, am I not, why am I not improving my 40 yard dash? Well, shit, you only been squatting once a week. And um, so I know, Jared, I know. So then once you tell them what they've been doing and they say, I know, I know. Well, look, hey, look, th this guy squatted three, three days a week. He's 220 and he runs a four, six, 40 yard dash. And so you can see those kids that are squatting more frequently actually at the end of each month are getting better improvements on their running speed. So now you've got all these people pulled together. And now you can show the kids that are not improving their running speed like they want to. The reason was because these people are actually squatting a lot more often. And this year I've had so many people scared to miss because of the results that they're getting is during spring practice this year, I had most of my football players, I would say about 90% of all my football athletes came after spring practice. So they go to school, weight training in school, after school, they go to practice, and guess what after practice? They came to the gym. And so we're working through this summer, trying to get them, a lot of them going through camps, a lot of them are getting good results, to where we're trying to get these kids some offers. It's all about trying to help those kids get offers so that they can improve. So I know I went off on a long tangent of what I'm looking for when I'm training people. I want people to get faster. I want people to jump higher. I want people to be stronger in their upper body so that 
now if I improve your bench and you're testing your golf swing speed, boom, you're seeing improvement in that. If you're testing your baseball throw speed, you're seeing an improvement in that. I want you to get what you want. So I got all these kids. I just don't have a master list of the programs, kind of like I'm going to go over. Um, that's just kind of like, oh, genetically printed out. You know, you got some of these kids, oh, they see all the freaks in the gym. They've been through there long enough. And for years, I'd have a kid, who, if he's going to go to whatever Power 5 D, D1 university, they all of a sudden get that stupid program from that university. Ooh, it's this university. Hey, they just won a national championship. Hey, they are in this bowl. Hey, they're in the Orange Bowl. Hey, Jared, this, we were in the Rose. That team was just Rose. I want to do their pro. Well, look, bring it in. Let me look at it. Okay, well, let's get into that. I got this kids program right here. So for the month of May, four day split. Okay, so he's got two upper, two lower. Uh, day one, front squat. Day two, barbell overhead press. This is a football player. Front squat, day two, barbell overhead press. Day three, deadlift. Day four, close grip bench press. Why is he not front squatting twice a week? You know, so he's only squatting minimal once a week, so he's going to be that other kid. No one of these universities don't know a damn thing about sprint speed because they don't test it. They don't test the 40 yard dash. You know what they're testing? They're testing miles per hour, which is absolutely stupid for most of the players on the football team. Now, if you're a wide receiver or a defensive back, that miles per hour is fine. But if you're a defensive lineman, if you're a linebacker, if um, you're a DN, running back, that elasticity, that miles per hour training is absolutely worthless because you're getting that better 20 to 40 time with the miles per hour training, but your zero to 20 time is not improving as much as it should. The You can have a kid that runs a 4.940 yard dash, and you can have a kid that runs a 4.5740 yard dash. The kid that runs the 4.9 runs his backside from 20 to 40 in a 2.00 or 1.98 at, at the best running a 4.9 with that high back end speed. Well, the kid that running a 4.57 and a kid that runs a 4.59 are both running a 1.90. So at the greatest, if you're already running 1.98, the most you will improve your 40 yard dash is 0 0.08 if you continue to work on that last history of miles per hour training. So if the kid's running 2.00, 20 to 40, and these other kids are running 1.90 and they're running in four fives, the most important thing, if you just kept on your last history, you're not going to be knocking out what you need to. You have to have a great 0 to 20 time. And then the back half, being that you got a greater acceleration, that back half may, tell, may fix itself without even having to do any elasticity training. And that's what we're trying to figure out. You know, if this piece can help these other people improve much better with their back half. But you know, because I've had some kids that can run the same thing, run actually faster in 20 and have a bad, worse back half uh, than another kid. They may end up running the same 40, but if that other kid would improve his freaking power to where he was running a better 20, his 40 would be even greater. It could be a tenth of a second greater, even um, 12 hundredths of a second greater, just because you have to find his speed. But no, Jared, we need to focus on this. No. No, 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 but you see all this BS out there on the internet with all these people wanting to do stuff. You will never get to where you want to go if you don't freaking listen or understand exercise physiology and what it actually takes to do something. So you're gonna get your greatest improvement. If you're running a 290, don't you think you need to get down to a 26? You can get greater tenths of a second off in the first 20 than you can the last 20. So that's my hope on the freaking the kid catapult stuff on the miles per hour and all that stuff. I don't like it, I don't do it, and I'm not gonna do it because I'm trying to prove another. there's another way. If you're training track athletes or if you got people out there in track training, that, at that point in time, the mile per hour stuff is gonna be more important than the short sprint speed. But most of my people are baseball players, home to first, 30 yards, softball players is 20 yards, then you got your, your football players, they play mostly within about a 12 to 15 yard 
box. So they're never getting anywhere to that point to where having to reach those miles per hour or top end running speeds. They're always in acceleration phase and never getting a chance to use that. So if you're playing 60 plays uh, football game and you reach top speed two of those plays, you're gonna, use, you're gonna need a lot more of that acceleration for most of your game than you will that other stuff. But a lot of these coaches and stuff are being pressed on with all that, whatever they're getting at these national conferences and stuff. I don't like it. I think we need to do something about it and I need to figure out how to get a push against it. Because that's not right. If you wanna have a hell of a team, get them stronger because they're gonna have a greater zero to 20 time. But anyway, back off that, off that ramp. Front squat, so day one, we're gonna front squat. They want to do RDL, leg extension machine, and then dumbbell lunges. The thing is, they're front squatting eight reps, four sets of eight, RDL, four sets of six, leg extensions, three sets of 10, core choice. You, you're giving them an option of what the hell they want to do for their stomach. Why don't you tell them what to do for their stomach and tell them how many sets and how many reps for it stuff. So I think that's absolutely ridiculous. The next time, and look at the reps. Front squat. I just told you earlier in this podcast, anything over five reps is going to be useless for running speed. And who the hell wants to hold a front squat for eight reps? And um, it's not even telling them what mode or whatever to use. You're just telling them eight reps of shit. If you want to go do 95 pounds for eight reps, go do 95 pounds. What's that going to do? It's not going to prove your stuff. You know, I've had kickers come in that came. I had college D1 kickers come to me during the season. From, Atlanta, from the Atlanta area, drive down, and they improve their kicking distance by 10 to 15 yards to kicker, the punter, and some other kickers. Um, they had greater distance just because I got them stronger, and I'm gonna attribute to kicking distance to the dumbbell jumps because I got stronger, but the dumbbell jumps helped sharpen that rate of force on them. So they were getting greater worse rate of force development with the squats. Like I said, so those fibers were being shifted. Now with the dumbbell jumps, those fibers are, boom, learning how to fire, learning how to fire. So now they're getting greater kicking distances. Um, Will Lutz, uh, he's a kicker for the Saints. When he was training with me, he was coming down during college and getting for two years training, training, and as his jump height improved, so does his kicking distance improve. Uh, and uh, he was a walk-on at, um, I don't want to know if I should say the university, but anyway, he was a walk on at this university, which is D1 school. He ended up taking the starting kicking job and the starting punting job by the time he was done. Now he's one of the highest paid kickers in the league. So, you know, if you're going to come to me, I'm going to make sure that, hey, I'm going to try to help you get on the team. And if you got to have greater kicking distance, like um, I had this kicker, this maybe not this past year, the year before, he quit coming because his agent got in his stupid head and said, hey, you need to go work on your technique, you need to go work on your technique. Hey, it's like, hey, you need to go work on your running mechanics, you need to go work on your running mechanics. Well, guess what? When they make the shift to the dark side, they stay in the freaking dark because the kid, when he went to the Texans, he came back and there was a report, he didn't have enough power. No shit. <laughs> These agents are kind of retarded as well, so you gotta help them out with that stuff. The um, you know, it's amazing what people don't know. How do, you, how do I get from here out there to help these people understand? I've got the results. Most people are not measuring for the results so that they don't know. They wanna go by what, oh, hey, this kid did this. No, I actually have written down kicking distances per month and all this stuff to where I actually, I kind of know and I attribute it to the dumb up jumps and squat. If, if jumping and running are correlated and if you got this kicker, the one when he had the power, he went up 15 yards kicking distance. He went from a five flat 40 to a four seven 40 yard dash. He was running a two seven five and 20. After he came back from his technical kicking training, he was back to running a two nine three. So if a kicker is running slower and the 40 yard dash, that means that leg swing, that cycling through the leg when it comes through to kick the ball, that's also gonna be slower. Just saying. So, more rants with that, but I'm really trying to hone in on these training programs because these people are paying money for this crap and they're getting to decide what damn weight they're doing lifting. <laughs> it's absolutely comical to me. Uh, barbell overhead press on day two, lat pull down machine, overhand wide grip, uh, maybe a lat pull down machine too, but that's another block, and a single arm dumbbell overhead press, and a dumbbell lateral raise. Okay eights, tens, and sixes, all right? 
let's go to our deadlifts. Sets of four, at least we drop the reps down. Then um, split squats, sets of six, core of choice, leg curl machine. So day one, we did leg extension. Day two of lower body, we're gonna do leg curl. Man. Day one of upper body, we're gonna do barbell overhead press. Day two, we're gonna do a close grip bench press. Absolutely amazing for eight reps. So, and that was for, for the first month. Second month, let's see what happens. Day one, oh, we actually got the back squat and we actually got the four reps. Hmm. Uh, day two, incline bench, flat pull down, underhand grip instead of overhand grip this time. And um, so we got a back squat, an incline, a deadlift. So we got deadlift consistent through the programming, then we have bench press. So we're actually only benching once a week and we got sets of five, which is not horrible for sets of five. And incline press for sets of five, that's not horrible. But you know what, at close mechanics, we're gonna bench and we're gonna incline the same damn day, not split it throughout the week. <laughs> and so it's kind of like back squat and deadlift. We may back squat if I have people deadlift, we're gonna back squat, we're gonna deadlift on the same day. We're not gonna split it out throughout the week. You know, I, I understand that these kids have gotta go play football. Well, the kids coming to me that are playing football and that are playing these other sports, are still doing that and still improving the 40 yard dash time. Dude, I got the kids trying to get scholarships. I'm not got the kids on this already on the team that really good as they come in as a freshman. Next year, they're not so damn good. I've seen that happen just through the years. So there's that. Um, I want to get in, I got some more to go through here, but uh, well, let's kick this one. I got this, uh, this one right here. This is, this is absolutely the most horrible training program I've ever seen. It's a four day split, so we're working out four days a week. Two days are um, strength lifts, and two days are mobility, okay? And for their, they have a front squat, day one. Day three, they have a trap bar deadlift. So kind of like this program over here, we're still front squatting once a week. The next time a week, we're gonna trap bar deadlift. Then we're gonna do an inverted row, one day, then we're gonna pull up. So they're doing upper and lower on the same day, which is fine, but you're, you're not hitting anything consistent. The people come to the gym. I've even had some adults start coming and they're scared to miss from the gym because when they know when they miss, one, if my adults are benching twice a week, if they miss that one, that struggles and the bench goes down. I also have people like my, my athletes. They know if they miss that bench, if they're not hitting it a minimum twice per week, three times is optimal, but if they're not hitting it, they're not making their sets and reps at the gym. And so I try, try to, if you show up and you hit this, you'll get all this stuff. But if you kind of want to dictate what you do and not bench as often, you're, you're not going to get the results. And, and the thing about that, I had this kid, he walked in the gym the other day and he said, I'm going to do a upper day. I said, no, yesterday was your upper day, you missed it. And he's kind of looked at me. I think a lot of these kids, when they're watching TikTok, Instagram, or they're going out to the gym on their own, they're going to kind of do everything as they want to. Like, oh, oh I, I did legs last time. I think I'm going to do a upper this time. Oh, I did a upper last time. I think I'll do legs. By the time you know it, they may have benched once that week, squatted twice that week. They don't know what the hell they're doing. And so if a kid comes in and he's supposed to be coming every day and he comes in on Wednesday and wants to squat, no, you missed your squat day. That was yesterday. But you're not got to squat. Yeah, tomorrow. And so you got to hold them accountable. You got to hold some type of reliability to these kids. You know, like when you were on the West Side, you didn't dictate or tell Louie what the hell you were doing when you got there. You know you're gonna bench on Sunday, you're gonna squat on Monday, and then you got Wednesday and Friday. And if you miss one of those days, oh, you're kicked out of the damn place. You know, I'm not kicking these kids out, but I'm just trying to damn teach them. You have to have some type of consistency if you want to get the best results. And for these people, front squatting once a week, sets of five, not bad, but it says, keep it light. Let's do front squats, it's five, keep it light. <laughs> and I saw this person working out and they were not, a, 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 this is, uh, they kept it light. When they had the capability of front squatting 185 pounds, they were doing 95 pounds. If you do not maintain or uphold a certain threshold or a certain load 
of your maximum, you're going to get weaker. And so I've had kids go off to college and they start, ooh, ah, these programs. And uh, they end up all of a sudden getting slower. Their miles per hour on their speed, on their throws are getting less. You know, I've asked softball girls that go to college and they're softball pitchers. Some of them are nationally ranked softball pitchers. Some of them are top, top five best in the country out of the gym. And they know when they start losing their strength, their, their miles per hour starts dropping. So then I get a call or they come over the summer, we start trying to work on it again. Um, and so, you know, I had a girl, they didn't do a whole lot, a whole lot of bicep, didn't have any bicep programming on them. But if you got a softball pitcher, sometimes those girls have bicep issues because that bicep is under stress and strain as it throws so much. And the coaches are not even programming anything like that into the program. No pull-ups, no bicep work. Uh, lap pull downs, supinated grip, I don't understand that. That's not in there, but yeah, it hurts some. These people, need, no one of the strength conditioning field gets so they're not getting paid enough because they don't damn know enough. Um, so I don't understand it. You know, it may be different when they get there, but these summer programs and things that they're sending home is absolutely god awful. So um, they, hey, either do this program, they need to be telling these kids either do this program or go to someone that knows what the hell they're doing. Because I think sometimes these kids get these programs like, mm, I just do this. What they gave them was a routine. They didn't give them a result-oriented program. So anyway, I just think that's awful for front squat, inverted row, dumbbell bench press, three sets of 10. These generic things that you could print out of an elementary school strength conditioning book. Trap bar deadlift sets of five, pull-ups sets of eight, um, use a band if needed, RDL, and back extensions, just some basic stuff, but they're doing back extensions one day, RDL the next. They're not even getting the same stimulus. So if you're not doing a lot of the same stuff over and over, not getting the same stimulus, just like the bench I just explained about, if you're not staying consistent in your squat, if you're gonna front squat, freaking front squat, and be consistent with it. If you're gonna back squat, back squat, be consistent with it. If you're gonna box squat, box squat, be consistent with it. Now, I like front squats. I can improve your jump height with front squats. And some people improve their 40 yard dash with front squats. The thing about front squats is, people are not going to want to front squat with loads that I'm giving them. Now, I just had an eighth grader front squat 315, but I drove his back squat up at 425, then just to see, see if he never front squat before, but they front squat 315. If you drive one, the other one should drag. If the other one's not dragging, you need to focus on it. So, anyway, well, there's that program right there. So, let's get into this. The thing I like about this, this guy is a golfer. He said, Jared, long time listener of the pod and following category we've talked about before, slow power lifter. I know you read golf in the subject line and probably deleted this already. Actually, Justin, I love this golf. I am just sorry it's taken me this long to get to it. Um, so this guy is trying to get golf and at least he recognized golf Fitness online as my version of speed camps is so much bullshit fluff. I purchased programs online that were honest garbage, and I have spent a bunch of money for them. Okay, that see that's what I need to help is people like this. He's spending a bunch of money on this garbage stuff. Let's see. Okay. All right. No more thing I see that I hate is RP. You're letting this guy see what RP of seven seven is. If I squat my people at the gym and I film them, they're thinking they're squatting. If you was going to base this off a stupid RPE scale, they're thinking they're squatting at about a nine. When if you watch them squat, they're actually squatting it at a five RPE, but they're filming a nine. So you're letting their feelings get in the way. Eh, enough of this feeling shit going out there in the world anyway. Um, so let's see, three days a week, which is not horrible. Um, Front squat, five, six, three on day one. Day two is upper body with bar, bell RDL with um, split squat. So day two looks like it's a combination. Well, they're all combos. So this must be done Monday, Wednesday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, looks like. So you're gonna start off with a box jump, then you're gonna go to front squat, then you're gonna do a bent over row, then you're gonna do a dumbbell incline press hamstring curls, planks, and farmer's walks, or farmer's holds, okay? Day two, 
Um, you can do a med ball chest press, then you're gonna do a side toss with med balls, then you're gonna do a barbell RDL, then you're gonna do a barbell bench press, weighted pull-ups, four sets four. Um, they're giving them no load, they're giving them sets and stuff, but if you're not, I, did, I think I did a podcast a while back where it's talking about the rule of five, 5%, so if you go up, so if you can get a set of five, you can increase the load 5% and do sets of three. If you're getting fours, try to turn those fours into fives so that we can, I like fives and threes, sometimes we do hit fours. Um, but they're not giving them, and the rule of thumb with the five pound jump, so if you're in the hundreds, I don't care if you're, if you're 155 pounds or less, your bench max, so to speak, that's gonna be five pound weights. So if you're in a 200 pounds, you're gonna be 10 pound weights. If you're in a 300 pounds, you're gonna be doing 15 pounds weights. If you're 400 pounds, um, you're gonna be doing 20 pound weights. So it just depends on where you are on the strength spectrum. Uh, this kid the other day at the gym, he was doing, he did uh, three, 65 on bench, three sets of three. Well, he's close, he's done 400, so that's 20 pounds, you know, 5% of 400 is 20. And so I was wanting to see if he could get three sets of three, so just not just work up to the top set. We're doing three sets of three at 365, then jump to 385, a set of three. Hmm. He got his set of three at 385, so that means I can come back down and possibly get five at 365. And then kind of go back and forth until we're able, now uh, two weeks I should have him rep 405 for two to three reps, would be sick. Could be entering a senior year at 215 pounds. Uh, sorry, get back to this golf stuff. Mm. Barbell bench press, four sets of three. The thing is, he's inclined bench pressing day one. Day two, he's barbell bench pressing. And day three, he's doing a military press. So he's doing some type of variation of a press. If you're gonna take a press, drive your bench press. Oh, once we get your bench press for wherever you want it, now we can drive your incline. Then if you wanted to do your, um, overhead press or military press, we can do that. I don't see military press correlated with any swing speed, so I won't be doing any military pressing. And the thing about military pressing is you're making your front delts, if you're trying to be a bencher, you're making your front delts stronger, so you're taking away, you're, you're keeping what's stronger, your shoulders naturally stronger than your triceps, so if you keep attacking that delt, you're gonna not ever allow that tricep to override the delt, so you can always have some shoulder issues when you bench, your elbows going out, cause a little bit more stress in your shoulders. Make them weaker, make your tricep stronger, and you, you can actually have less shoulder pain. So the thing I see, uh, chest supported reverse flies. Basically what this guy got was a routine. Come in and do this, 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 this. Yeah, that's, he's got a box jump, he's got a freaking squat, he's got to do a rows, he's got to do, it's probably taking him an hour, a little bit more just to do what's on day one, same thing for day two. So he's going in and he's working, like I said, working, but it's not getting paid because he's not getting results. If bench press is correlated, but the golf community don't know that because they, <laughs> you got Justin Thomas, Jordan Spieth, and all these kids, they're not very big if you see them in person. But they're highly consistent with what they do. You know, but what happens with a golfer that's highly consistent and has a high end swing speed, but no strength, they start breaking down because the ligaments, tendons, and fibers cannot they ha it has a lot harder time when it has to produce that force over and over, so they start breaking down somewhere else. It may not technical, the muscular system, the nervous system, all that stuff's gonna have a lot more stress on it because it can't handle the forces being applied to it over a certain amount of time. And so, you know, a lot of their backs bother them. That rotational stuff that you see on the Golf Channel and some of that stuff is, just please get stronger golfers. It would change your whole world. Bryson DeChambeau should have, should have showed everybody that. Look at uh, Brooks Kafka. These people are strong and big. Brooks is killed. I hope I don't know how he's doing at the U.S. Open this week, but I need to get back on there, see who's doing what. The thing is, I do pay attention to it. I do know Bryson DeChambeau should be the prime example. Brooks Kepka. He just uh, Brooks just won the PGA last month. Um, I was hoping he'd win the Masters, but uh, I can't believe he's choking. He's on average choke, but whatever. So anyway, this guy was front squatting. One day, what's day two? Bulgarian squat, four shit. And then a barbell split squat, three different tile squats, try to get familiar with it. Uh, 
And then the next one, Force is King, RP of seven. Uh, back squat, Force of six. The next floor, the next day, day two, trap bar deadlift. Again, just like these other programs, let's squat one day and let's trap bar deadlift or work our way back the next. Why not do this shit the same day? Uh, dumbbell split squat jumps, ISO barbell split squat. So, back squat, trap bar deadlift, split squat. This is going to be the main list. Three different days, all that stuff. Not cool. Golfer, day one, as he's getting deeper into the program, med ball, okay, toss, barbell, incline press, four sets of six. Uh, Barbell bench press. So barbell incline press, barbell bench press, and even worse, barbell push press. So just like a like you would see like old school powerlifting, incline press, a barbell press, then another shoulder press thing. So uh, Justin, hope I answered some of your questions. Trying to get back to you, but you know he spent a lot of money, a lot of programs, and that's kind of what you're getting when you're, when you're doing that, which is frustrating for me. And so I had this uh, guy, another guy, paid a lot of money for this uh, this, uh, this program right here. Ah, and it's, it's a lot. It's several, several hundred bucks. Okay, so day one, you know what, said bed press, you know what we'll do? We'll do weighted freaking push-ups. Uh, and so that's upper and our next upper body day we will do a dumbbell bench press or a Swiss bar press we're going to do sets of eight hey on our weighted push-ups on day one this is four days but so you got two upper two lower we're going to do three sets of eight on weighted push-ups and then on the next upper body day with our dumbbell bench press we're going to do three sets of eight that nuts um, so the lower body day Paul's front squat Paul's front squat not a bad idea not a bad exercise uh, sets of six no specific load weighted push-ups no specific load uh, how, what, what the hell are they measure how are they testing if you're not you can come to me and just hey Jared I'm gonna write your program I want you to tell me what to, you want me to give you a routine or you want me to give you results. And a lot of these people are getting routines with no damn results. And that's what's so frustrating. And so let's see what our next, so two bright days, the core lifts, the main thing that's supposed to be making you stronger. Let's go, day one, upper body, weighted push-ups, okay? Pinley rows, okay? And then yoga push-ups. We're doing a lot of damn push-ups for our core lifts. And then our accessories, then over lateral holds, scout push-ups and stuff. So, oh boy. Okay, so now let's go to the second of my day, core lifts. Dumbbell bench press. Physio ball push-ups, oh boy. Main accessories, accessories don't matter at that point. It was so bad. Uh, the main thing for lower body, let's go front squat pause, not a bad exercise. Barbell glute bridge. Uh, I heard Charles Pollock would say, the only time you need to do a barbell glute bridge is when you dismount a heavy sexual partner. So we'll get that out of the way. Sled drags, wide stance, lateral cable, cross chop, whatever. Okay. And the, let's see if the second day, so our upper body is weighted push-ups, then dumbbell bench press. Mm. Dumbbell bench press is an accessory lift, not the main strength of that. So, not getting stronger. Uh, core. Ah, barbell deadlift. Mm. Sets of eight. Who the hell deadlift sets of eight? Oh, boy. So, a lot of these things that you're seeing is, they're going to do one squat a week then they're gonna do some type of other lower body thing. Like some people may power clean or whatever whatever have you. And some of these people wanna be good at power cleans, but they wanna power clean once a week at school. How in the hell are you ever gonna improve anything when you're doing it once a week? You know, if you're like a super kid beginner, maybe I've had kids in the past that came once a week. 
and improvements, but you will get to a point to where that once a week will no longer work for you. So you need to be telling someone, hey, you need to be, you need to be showing up or it's not worth your time. And I had this kid that was super unathletic show up to the gym the other day. And his dad said, you think you can help him? I said, no, I can help anybody that's consistent. I said, you don't have to be the world's greatest athlete or anything like that. Um, I had kids years ago that couldn't jump over a sheet of paper, ended up going to get a track scholarship for college for a uh, way through. So it's, it's consistency, sit there, get the results over and over again. You know, I've gotten over 40 people to jump a 40 inch vertical, looking at these training programs. I think people are not getting training programs to actually physically improve training results. They're getting um, workout regimens, things to do. Um, so this here's, here's another person right here. Let's go with this one too. Uh, first time I've seen hand cleans on these programs. So we got hand cleans. We got a squat progression. At least this program. Oh damn, that's got even tempos. A three one one tempo. Well, it's not a Charles Pollock one tempo where you got four numbers. Squat progression. They're only working up to 70% for three reps. Holy shit, how easy is 70% for three reps? So not enough stimulus. The minimum, and you heard me talk about brief maximum tension, 85% you start the person off at, then you figure out based off their reps and their the right backs who you what to do next. Not just assume. I think a lot of these people are giving these people programs, hey, do this, good luck, see you in six, six months. Uh, man, all right, I want everybody to go out there. I want you to do work up to two sets of three at 70% of your front squat. Uh, do that three days a week. Tell me what happens. You do that three weeks, but I guarantee you they're not getting that. <sighs> yes, identical, almost. All right, so we got one squat progression. And you're working on 70% for three reps. That's day one. The day two, we got bench press, overhead plate raise, inverted row. So day two is basically upper body. Day one, you got hand cleans, squat progression, chin ups, RDLs, and paddle off press. So you, mainly in the lower body. Then day two, you got hand, hand, uh, hand cleans, bench press. Overhead plate raise, inverted rows. Okay. The next time, hey, guess what, everybody? If you've been listening to this food podcast, listening to your rant and kind of go over these things, guess what the second lower body day of the week would be? It is trap bar deadlift. <sighs> Barbell up rows, trap bar jumps, dumbbell RDL, and some push ups. And they're benching once a week, they're doing push ups once a week. It's almost like the identical thing to this, this thing over here. Jeez. Okay, that's my frustrating. Why are these? And the only time I saw any percentages was with the uh, squat progression and the bench press. Everything else is left up to the athlete to choose. Good. I guess they're just people are just being super cautious. But you got people that are paying high dollar for programs, and you're getting really nothing. A workout routine. They're not getting a training routine. There's a difference between working out and training. A lot of people, if you listen to this podcast, you know the difference between working out and training is. So hopefully I didn't get off on too much, uh, too many rants. But I just wanted to get off and say, you know, when I do stuff, I, I'm helping athletes. I'm not into the adult fitness industry to where I'm trying to help. Hey, let's lose 50 pounds. Hey, let's just give you a routine. But some people, if you just want a routine and you're not trying to improve a specific parameter, that's fine. That stuff that I just went over would be just fine if you just wanted a routine. But if you actually want to go in the gym and go from 225 to 315 on your bench press or 315 to 405, you're going to have to be kind of smart about it. Um, you know, if you want to run a faster 40 yard dash, if you want to jump a higher vertical, if you need to jump a better broad jump, you know, that's it, it's the stuff that I'm doing that we're trying to get specific measurables out of. I'm not just giving somebody an exercise routine and saying, good luck. Hope you get better. Best of luck to you. I'm actually testing these parameters each month and getting frustrated with, with people thinking, oh, I need to do this routine. Oh, this routine. 
I mean, all this TikTok stuff is really getting bad because you're getting, hey, Jared, I did up right last time. I need to do a lower bite. Nope, absolutely not. You skipped it. So, you know, trying to hold these kids accountable, but you just can't come in and do what you want to. If you just do that, guess what? I don't need you at the gym. You won't be here very long anyway. So, anyway, if you all have questions, please feel free to email me. I do take a while to get back to people. I, um, I'm busy myself. I got stuff to do. Um, my wife likes to see me when I get home sometimes. So anyway, I hope this helped. If you have questions, please uh, email me, info at Explosive Mechanics. That's the best thing to do because I'll keep it, hold to it like I did that other guy's email. And uh, when I get ready to do a podcast or when I, I, sometimes, a lot of times, if you listen to this podcast, my emails, when I reply back to people, go to spam. So you may not, why haven't I heard from Jared? Hey, check your spam. And if you've not heard from me after a couple months, I'll say, hey, look, I'll hold on this for a podcast. I'll get back to you. And, um, or, you know what? Feel free, y'all can give me a call. So uh, I just talked to some guy this morning uh, about the jump mat and the, vert the vertex uh, correlating. So anyway, hope that helps. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Info at Explosive Mechanics. Message me on Instagram sometimes. I do not. I hold on to that, but sometimes when the inbox gets too full, I kind of get wonky with it. So anyway, you can also reach out to me, uh, DM at Explosive Mechanics on Instagram, Twitter at Explosive MVC. Watch the YouTube videos. We'll be putting out some more of that stuff. So uh, thank you all for watching. Thank you for listening. Have a good day.